my heart is breaking in a way I never thought it could. My mind is racing with a question, are you still good? Could you make something from the wreckage? Would you take this heart and make it whole again? Though the mountains may be moved into the sea, though the ground beneath might crumble and give way, I can hear my father singing over me. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I blamed myself. And if I'm honest, maybe I blamed you too. But you would not forsake me. Cause only good things come from you. Though the mountains may be moved into the sea. Though the ground beneath might crumble. From beginning to the end, you're so close. You have never let me down, and you won't. In the valleys and the shadows, I know you're so close. You're so close. Though the mountains may be moved into the sea. might crumble and give way I can hear my father singing over me it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay we're gonna be okay we're gonna be okay I'm gonna be okay I'm gonna be okay No matter what's happening in your life today, family, trust that it's going to be okay. And the only reason it's going to be okay is because of Jesus, right? Let us pray. Father, this morning we thank you that no matter what we are going through, that indeed because of you, it is going to be okay. I pray now as we open your word that your Holy Spirit may open our understanding. Give us a heart to hear and a mind to do, so that we can also help others know that it can be okay with them as well. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. A pleasant, happy Sabbath to each and every one of us. My prayer is that you will be blessed. What you got to do is drag it over. By the challenging message for today, I believe that the Lord has so much for each and every one of us as we begin to look at our own life. We don't want to stay at the very same place always. We want to keep what growing. It is a spiritual journey for each and every one. We are all at different stages in our uh, spiritual growth and development. But God does have something for us. And today I want to look at a, a, a par parable that we are familiar with from the book of Luke chapter 10. So if you can stand as we read this scripture together, Luke chapter number 10, verses 25 through 28. Luke chapter number 25 through 28. I'll read the first verse, you read the second, and we'll read the last one together. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, or tempted him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Continue, help me out here. I'm, I'm squinting back there. 
and said, Love your God with all your heart and with all your and with all your and with all your and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered how everybody. Jesus replied, Amen. Please be seated. Now, this is a pas passage that we all know. This is a passage that we, we extrapolate many different things from it. And today I hope that I can add a little bit onto this message to help you to see this parable in a certain new light, in, as it were. Now, we all, even from children, uh, uh, knowing this passage, this Good Samaritan, uh, this passage did not start with the Good Samaritan. It's, of course, in context, Jesus, in the first verse of chapter 10, talks about sending out 70 uh, disciples. Two by two, he sent them out. And he gave them power to over demons and the like. And they came back rejoicing, thankful that God has used them and the, the demons were even subject to them. And Jesus said, listen, be careful, because I beheld Satan fell like lightning from heaven. Don't rejoice that these things are happening. Don't rejoice simply because miracles took place and demons were subject to you. He said, rejoice because your name is written in heaven. And after that, he rejoiced in himself, saying that, God, I thank you, Father, that you have, you know, hidden these things from the prudent, from the worldly wise, and have revealed them unto these young ones in the faith, as it were, children, babes in Christ. But then now he comes to this particular section because, of course, a lot of people were always following Jesus. And this man, lawyer, I think of a lawyer today. They know a lot about the law, don't they? This man stood up now. The purpose of his standing up, Scripture says, was not a good reason. Right, Brother Ferguson? It wasn't a good reason. I think we can deduce that, right? Because it said he stood up to test or tempt Jesus. So he did not have an honest approach to Christ, but nonetheless, we hope that it ended that way. The man says, good teacher, master, Lord, what shall I do to inherit, what is it, everybody? Eternal life. So he's asking a good question. It's a spiritual question. But one must wonder, does he really want to know the answer? But nonetheless, it's a good question. And I would think that, Jesus is answering this question. Because when someone asks you a question, it is for you to provide an answer. Now, Jesus had many strategies of answering questions. There are times when they ask a question, and he asked them a question. Because he knew their heart. There are times when they ask a question, and he would actually begin to break down the scriptures to them so they can understand. But there are many times when indeed folks ask a question, and he would relay this story. Because within the story is the answer to the question. Now, if I were to ask you today, or your child, or some stranger was to ask you, how can I inherit eternal life? What would be your answer? First of all, many of us will go straight to, Jesus died for you. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. And would that be a correct statement? Yes, it would. John 3, 16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have what? Everlasting life. Isn't that what the man is asking? How can I have eternal, everlasting life? But Jesus did not answer that man in the conventional way. It reminded me also of the story of the rich young ruler. Remember this man. He came... Just like this lawyer, the rich young ruler had a lot of wealth. He came to Christ, wanted to follow Jesus, wanted to also have eternal life. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And basically, Jesus replied to both of them in the same way. So now, Jesus said, well, you are a lawyer. You know the law. So what is written in the law? How do you understand it? You tell me how one can inherit eternal life. And the man went on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and so forth. Jesus commended the person. He said, you have answered correctly. 
He did not answer incorrectly. He answered correctly. But Jesus said to him what? Do this and you will live. Now, can we say that that was an answer to this question? What do you think? Yes or no? Was that an answer to the question? Yeah. How can I inherit eternal life? Jesus, when the man gave this reply, he said, you have answered correctly. Now, if you do this, you shall live. What was his question? I want to live, but not just live for the here and now. He says, I want eternal life. And Jesus says, by doing this, you are able to have eternal life. Wow. How do we take that today? Does that sound like maybe there is something we have to do to inherit eternal life? What Jesus was really saying here, my friends, is Jesus was giving us a clearer understanding of what it means to keep the commandments or laws of God. That's the one thing I want to leave with you today, that the commandments of God are linked to, indeed, eternal life. But it is more than what we think it to be in the sense of keep the Ten Commandments and that is all there is to it. Not necessarily. We started on Tuesday night a study on the laws of God. And we are beginning to see that the Ten Commandments are God's big, bold contract that he has given to us. And many of us stay right there. But what follows Exodus 20 in chapter 21, 22, 23, 24, Deuteronomy, and, and, and so forth, are principles of how one keeps the Ten Commandments. If you say you should not kill, what does that mean? What does that look like? Are all cases murder? Obviously not. When you say you should not commit adultery, I don't know, what does that mean? How does that look? What constitutes adultery. So if we only just look at the bold heading, then we are still missing some things. And that's why when Jesus came on the scene and he had the Sermon on the Mount, he took several chapters to explain the spiritual nature of the law and not just the simple letter of the law. He came to explain this is what it means. So murder is not just if I go and murder my brother physically and take his or her life. He says, if you even think malice towards them, you can be murdering in your heart. Adultery is not only the physical act of being in a sexual relationship. He says, if you look in your mind and in your heart against a, 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 a person, you are committing adultery in the heart if you are lusting. Wow. You wouldn't get that just simply by having the Ten Commandments, as it were. What does it mean to honor my mother and my father if it was just a blanket statement? One has to teach children how to do that. If I say honor your mother, even today, many of us still probably struggle. How do I really honor my mother and father? Well, that's where the rest of it came in when he says, for example, if a son or a daughter is rebellious against their parents, that is a form of dishonoring them if they consistently are disciplined and they refuse to be obedient to their parents, take them down to the city square and let the elders do what with them. That was protecting and showing you how to keep the Ten Commandments or the, that command of honoring your parents. So here now, this man is asking an interesting question, and I beg to tell you, it's not just simply Jesus wanted the man to, to know doctrine or know the, the letter of the law. The man was already a lawyer. The man knew the law, but Jesus was showing the man that you are not actually living the law. You are not keeping the law. You say you know it. It's just like the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler said, all these I have kept from my youth. Jesus said, listen, that is good and admirable. However, there is one thing that you lack. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. Now, I thought the man was keeping the commandment. He said, listen, <laughs> I got too much money. And the scripture says he went away sad. 
Why? Because he had too much money. What does it mean? It means that that rich young ruler did not love his neighbor. He did not love his neighbor. Why? Because he was not willing to give up what he had in order to be a blessing to someone else. And so instead of Jesus arguing with this gentleman on what the law is, he now proclaimed this particular parable. This story of the rich young rule, I mean, of the good Samaritan. So here we go now. Instead of taking this, because Jesus said, go, do this, and you will live. So right there, I would think the man, he got his answer. So if you wanted eternal life, Jesus just gave you the recipe, as it were. Go, do the recipe, and you are okay. Now we see the man's heart was not in the right place. Now he's making an argument now. He says... Well, who is my neighbor? Scripture said he wanted to justify himself. He didn't want to just finish the argument right there. He got his answer, but now he needed a little more. He says, who then is my neighbor? I don't have to in God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength. See, some of the commandments are related to what? God, vertical. And others, this is where we got the problem. Oh, we can pray all day. The parable, I'm showing you, the parable actually has this in there. Because the first person, he said there came a priest and saw the priest was going to church on Sabbath. The priest was going to probably deliberate or give some offering or something or sacrifice. The priest was doing his religious duty to God. And he saw this man in need. And he didn't even walk inside. So that's the pastor. Coming to church on Saturday morning, somebody broke on the side of the road, I got to get to church because I ain't got to go preach this word this morning. And then comes the elder. That's the Levite. The Levite came by. At least the Levite came close. So the Levite, the, the elder, would come on Sabbath morning. I want to help, however, I might be late to the service. I got to give the opening or something along those lines. Now, here comes no Bible. This man broken down on the side of the street, but Heaven says that total no who was neighbor to this person? The one who met their need. What we need in the last day proclamation. Is proclaimed, but we have the declaration in our lives. The verbalization of the gospel is going with words, but not in deeds and action. It is, it, it is the downfall of us today where we are not perishing for a lack of knowledge, we are perishing for a lack of application of knowledge. We know we live. The law says, keep the Sabbath the letter of the law. So what we focus on is what we cannot and should not do. But here it is to do on Saturday. We have to do the good that we need to do. Why? Because religious activity are sometimes actually living out the gospel principles or the principles of the law. See, this is the problem. This is the problem. I'm focused on my law keeping in the sense of I want to keep the son so that I don't help nobody, I don't do no good at all on Sabbath day. Whereas there are others in the Son of God who may do the church, but 
are more keeping the Sabbath than you and I are. It is simply a matter of intellectual assent to church that constitutes righteousness. It is righteousness being right do. <laughs> it is right. Therefore, the sermon is a sermon. Because the good character is how to be the sermon. No one emphasizes obedience to the priest Levite in the story. Why? Because the first one command the man to command to love your neighbor. That's the command. But the priest did not obey that command. The Levite obeyed that command. The Samaritan, the outsider, the as it were, actually obeyed the command. He went above and beyond in obeying the command in the sense that he not only ministered himself, it says he bandaged his wound. Then he took a here is Here is what he wanted. He said, whatever said, taking care of this, I will pay. Now, some have said actually represent the innkeeper. The innkeeper, so you want to like the where we minister to the church now is where we take care of them. And that's what Jesus, when he comes to the church, many times he has the church. Eve before no Jesus is what a blessing. You don't need more money by the way. What you need is you but we wait for the church member, even, even those inside the church. We can't help you right now because we broke or we did something. We're not. We are not. Every week we give, but you, you understand the principle. The church is called to be what we as individuals. If you want to afford money, people the church and the church can also give as well. I think every month when we give, whatever we give, the church Because you give to the church, holding on to the body, piling up, piling up, piling up. We got people. Can I tell you the message? It's not. If we keep the building, what are we doing? For the most part, Adventist or Christian. If we come church, let's go to other here. James one point six. We should know this one as well. Religion and only file before God and others. To visit the way spotted from the world. Pure religion, not verbalization, not pure religion, ministry. Who is that? Verse 17. If we know to do good and don't do it to us, it is. And 221. Also, talk about that. It's not only 
knowing the word, but is hearing doers of the word. Revelation chapter 3, it says, Blessed are those who hear, blessed are those who hear, blessed are those who do the commandments of the Lord God. And so God is Means when you do them. Isn't it so? We have to look at the spiritual nature of the law of God. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. It talks about what? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, you know, that's the section that, that, that contains. Jesus is very definite. And clear, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus is But we are only here. He said, the one who made this person understand was the one who heard the word. And does them, I would like you to what? Who build on the sand. Chapter 12 and verse number 50. Here it is when Jesus was doing his work. There's some people, people outside who see you, right? Your mother. But Jesus pointed towards his disciples. He stretched out his hands. In verse number 50, he says, Whoever does the will of the Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Who are the family members of Jesus Christ? Those who do the will is in heaven. Not those who hear about it, but those who actually live it, embody what it means to be a Christian. Embody the kingdom of God. So you may not be good for you. Simple acts of kindness and deeds of kindness are very, very important. And we can't pray our way out of it. We can fast our way out of it. We like to do all of these different things, right? Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59. You see, sometimes we wonder why is it that, you know, the spirit of the Lord is not moving among us and all of these different things. Well, it is not that God cannot hear us or, you know, he's not taking notice, but the problem is with us as his people. Isaiah chapter 59. That he cannot save, nor his enemy that he cannot hear. But what's the problem? He says, your iniquities have separated from you and your God, and your sins have hidden. Now, what would it look like? Because what is sin? Sin is what? A transgression of the law. Sin is not doing what is right. Unrighteousness. If right doing is righteousness, then unrighteousness is not doing righteousness. It says, he lists now, he says, your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips speaks lies, your tongue has muttered perversity, no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for the truth, they, they, they trust in empty words and they speak lies, they conceive of evil and they bring forth iniquity. This is the condition among God's people. And that's why God is saying, I don't want to hear it from you. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. 58, back up a little bit, turn to the left, hang left. Isaiah chapter 58 now, here the people again are saying, you know, why are we seeking God? We are doing these things, we seek him daily, right? He says, tell my people their transgression and the house of Israel their sin. What is it? He says, they seek me every day. They want to know my ways as if they were a nation that did what? Righteousness. And they did not forsake the ordinance or the commandments of God. They asked for uh, they ask for me ordinance of justice and they take delight in approaching God. But why then? They say, why have we fasted and he's not taking notice? Now he goes on to tell them, this is not the kind of fasting that I want for you. I'm not just asking of religious duties and religious um, things. I don't want you to just go to church and give your tithes and offering. He says, it is more than that. 
That's not what it's all about. Pagans can go to church and pagans can pay tithes and offering. It's not Christians alone that pays tithes and offering. Even the world pays tithes and offering. There are many wealthy business people who believe in the principle of tithing. So tithing is not going to get us into the kingdom of heaven. Now tithing is good. We should not um, leave that undone. But Jesus said there are some other weightier matters of the law. Some things that we have to become in the way that we live our lives. So he goes on to tell them now, let me tell you what it is that I really want from you. So you are breaking my commandments. So look at what commandment keeping looks like. He says now, I want you to, verse 6, 58, Isaiah 58, verse 6, I want you to loose the bands of wickedness. I want you to undo the heavy burdens. I want you to let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. When you, you share your bread with the hungry, bring those who are poor to your house and uh, take the naked and cover them, clothe them as it were. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. When you do those things, then indeed shall your light spring forth speedily. That's what the Lord is calling commandment keeping. Because why? That is how you love your neighbor. That is the practical demonstration and living out of how I should love my neighbor. How I should love the people and the children of God. Amos chapter 5. God doesn't really, let me tell you. In the last days, what God is looking for is not more people who just know about his commandment. People who can quote his commandment. God is looking for the church to embody the gospel and the great uh, uh, commission. Now, what did I say? Amos chapter 5 and verse number 21. Amos chapter 5, and we start with verse number 21. Notice this right here. This, right, this passage is such a powerful passage because, Sister Agape, you know what it tells me? God can get sick and tired of our, even our singing. God can get sick and tired of our worship. God can, God can even close up the church. Notice this, 21. He says, I hate... That's a strong phrase, wouldn't you agree? God says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. What is that? Your sacred gathering. These special occasions that you come to worship before me. Though you offer burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offering. Take away the noise of your songs. I don't want to hear your singing. Why? Because your singing is not a substitute for your being. Your singing is not a substitute for you doing what I've asked you to do. He says, I will not hear the melody of your strings instrument. What should you do instead? 24, but let justice run down like water or a mighty stream. Righteousness like a mighty stream. What is he wanting you? Do righteousness. Do the things that are good for your fellow neighbors. And all throughout this stuff, he was talking about how the people were oppressing the poor, oppressing the foreigners, oppressing uh, the orphans and the widows, charging exorbitant prices. In other words, they were good professors, but not good practitioners. This is a constant reminder and a rebuke to me every single week. I have to ask myself, God, it is not only that I want to be a preacher of righteousness. Am I a liver, <laughs> if that's a word? Am I one who is doing what I'm talking about here? Here's a quotation from Christ's object lesson that underscores this here. He says, in giving this lesson, now this is in regards to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Servant of the Lord says, in giving this lesson, Christ presented the what? The principles of the law. Have we ever looked at the story of the Good Samaritan as keeping the commandments of God? She says she gave it in a direct, forcible way, showing his hearers that they had neglected to carry out these principles. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners could find no opportunity to prevail. What should we do? We should show the same tender kindness to those in need. Thus, we shall give evidence that we do what? Keep the whole law. So you thought that keeping the whole law was just, you know, I don't take God's name in vain. I honor my father and my mother. I don't lie. I don't steal. Yes, that's good too. But the commandments of God, as we studied on Tuesday night, is more than the Ten Commandments. God 
the laws and principles spring from the Ten Commandments. But that's why he said, if you see your neighbor's donkey fall in a ditch, you have to help. Even if it was your enemy. Wow. That is keeping the law. That is the, how one carries out what the Ten Commandments requires. But we've lumped all of that and we say they're all done away with. <laughs> that's why we have trouble today doing kindness. You've got to beg us to really do what is kind. Right? It's hard to get us to, it's easy to get us, think about it, to do worship activities. Praise and worship, sing songs, get together to, you know, have a retreat and revival and those things. But the moment we say, let us go and minister to other people. Let us carry out these principles in our life. That's the struggle. That's what keeping the commandments also look like. Do you realize that everything that God tells you to do that's an affirmative thing? even the negative, is a command. So when he said, be kind to one another, that is a commandment. Not just because it's not in the moral law. He says, be ye kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. That's a commandment. Christ says, forgive and you shall be forgiven. Forgiveness is a command. So if I'm unforgiving, guess what I'm doing? I am sinning. Does that make sense? It is the law of Christ, and it is love demonstrated. See, this is the thing. That's what the world is waiting to see, the character of Christ perfectly reproduced in his people, and I believe it is then that the end shall come. Notice it here. God says, listen, you can take your church services and all of that and do away with it as far as I'm concerned unless you are doing what I command you to do. If we are not loving if we are not ministering to those in need, all of our worship amounts to no more than the pagans do. Why? Jesus said the same thing. Pagans love each other. Pagans do good to each other. He says, you're not doing anything special by loving those who love you. Not my words. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Because pagans do that. There are people in the world who have great marriages without being Christians. Some of their marriages are better than our marriages as Christians. Because these are eternal principles. And whoever lived them out experienced the blessings. There are people in the world who don't know Adventist health message and they're healthier than many of us are. So it's not just simply knowing the thing and thinking, oh, I'm close to God because I come to church. That is good. That is necessary. But what true righteousness looks like is when it is lived out. That's why Jesus came. Jesus could have wrote a love letter, sent it down to us. Send an email, <laughs> you know, even giving us the Bible and say, I love you. And if we read it, hey, we would have found out the love of the Father. But what did Jesus do? He came to demonstrate his love. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, he didn't tell us. It says he gave his only begotten son. How do we know that God loves us? By his action. He did the loving so now I know he is loving. He didn't just tell me he loved me. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 says, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Okay, that's good to know. How? With loving kindness I have drawn you. Jeremiah the prophet paints the picture. God chasing after his people actively. Ladies, if you're married, those who might be dating, I don't know if there's any, well, most folks in here are married. But what if a guy just says, I love you. You know, and he write all these love letters to you. No, that's good. It gives you, you know, the feeling, right? You know, you feel nice, you know what I mean? Oh, he's so, you know. But what if he never came around? <laughs> he never did anything kind? You're going to read this and you're going to say something is off here. He says a lot, but what if he stands you up five times in a row? Now, first time you forgive him because the letters were good. You know, some, some real smooth stuff. It was good. But after the third time, you're going to be like, come on now. Come on now. You stood me up. You forgot my birthday. You forgot all these other things. I, and you telling me you love me. Ladies, come on now. After a while, you're going to be like, nah, bro. I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not falling for it. I'm not buying it. So that's why Jesus says, if you love me, because that keeping is an, is an active word. It's a doing. Right? It's doing and being. So Jesus says, I don't want you to just tell me you love me. Right? I want you to show me you love me. 
as I have shown you that you love me. And he's saying, yes, there's some things you do towards me, but the way you treat my other children tells me how much you love me. Because he says, when you do it to them, you are doing it to And here's the opposite of that. When you don't do it to them, you didn't do it to him. Sins of omission, sins of commission. And so we, I me, mean, I think more, my struggle is not the doing. It's probably the not doing. There are things that I should do that I don't do. That's the problem for some of us and others. Let me read you one more real quick to underscore um, this. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel 14. Saints, I want you to get it clear today that we must be the sermon, not just talk about the sermon or hear the sermon. Because <laughs> in one angle, the more you know is the more you're accountable for. So it's kind of dangerous every week to listen to a message and not live it. You catch what I'm saying? Now check this out. Because what's going to happen is there can be things going on in your life. You're trying to pray, pray you know, because normally it seems like we're praying out of stuff. We're praying out of doing what God wants us to do. Look, notice this situation here now. In Ezekiel chapter number 14, it says, Now, some of the elders of Israel, those are church folks, as it were. Those are the remnant people. It wasn't just anybody. The elders, that's like the priest and the Levite. Stories are told in many different ways, the same thing. Notice this now. They came to me and sat down before me, Je uh, Ezekiel now, but here's what happened. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, <laughs> these men have set up idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Shall I let myself be inquired at all of them? Therefore, speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Every one of the house of Israel who sets up an idol in his heart and puts before him that which causes him to stumble into iniquity and then come to the prophet. <laughs> I, the Lord, how is God going to answer them? I'm going to answer them according to the idol that is in their hearts. That's the same thing Isaiah chapter 59 just said. In other, and Isaiah 58. We're fasting, we're doing this, we try, they're trying to know God's will. And God is saying, your life is full of sin and iniquity. There are things that I'm telling you to do, you refuse to do. And then you are coming to me, asking to know my will, asking for wisdom, guidance, knowledge, and understanding. You know how we do. Maybe, maybe it, the reason why we are not filled yet with the Holy Spirit of God in latter rain power, it is because we are not doing and being the true witnesses that God demands of us. Knowledge without application is hypocrisy in the kingdom of God. And I know it's challenging. It's not difficult. It's challenging because of our carnal nature. Our carnal heart wrestles against that which is good and righteous for us. And so that's why the prayer always, God help me to surrender and help me to become that which you want me to become. Help me to live out the precepts of what I want, of what you uh, rather, of what you want, and what you've asked of us in the last days. I have a uh, two video clip here. I'm going to share with you, and then we will make an appeal. Actually, I'm going to have the president of the World Church, the Seventh Adventist Church worldwide, make the appeal for us today. In a world dominated by indifference, loving my neighbor isn't easy. Envy, desire, wealth—these are distractions. They entice.
So which of these do you think today was neighbor to this man? Jesus is telling us to go and do likewise. Not go and think likewise. Not go and tell likewise. But go and do likewise. Every week that you get a message, the important thing is that that's why I normally put in my prayer, God, after we have heard this word, help us now to live this word. Because it is detrimental to the conscience when one knows to do good and do not do it. You and I are actually living in sin, according to the scriptures, when we do that. To him who knows to do good and do it not, to him it is sin. Why? Because doing good is generally a command. And what is sin? Sin is transgressing the law. So when I know what to do and I don't do it, I'm breaking the commandment of God. Christ showed that our neighbor does not merely, I mean, mean merely one of the church or of the faith, amen? Not just the church members. We can't just keep ministering to each other, which we need to do, Galatians 6, 10, do good to all men, but especially those in the household of faith. That's kingdom order. I believe in that, and I value that and celebrate that. We should minister to each other, just like a family. I don't expect you to go take care of everybody's kids and your kids are, you know, not taken care of. However, you can't just minister to your own house, Amen. Otherwise, Jesus could have stayed in, in heaven and have a good old time with him and the angels. But he left heaven and came down to us. All right? Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Simple. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Who is my neighbor? The person that you don't like. <laughs> who is your neighbor? Even your enemy that you don't like. Who is your neighbor? That foreigner, that immigrant that you despise, who you don't like. Who is your neighbor? That boss that you don't like, but who pays your bill anyhow. So you sort of kind of like him. <laughs> but not for real, for real. But that's still your enemy. That's still your, your, your neighbor. And we are called to do good to them. You should thank your neighbor for paying your bills. If you don't like him or her, you say, hey, God, thank you for using the devil to help me pay my bills. I mean, you're still thankful. You're expressing gratitude, amen? It's just the way you look at it. So we got to be the sermon in every single thing that we do because the mere profession of religion abounds, but it has little weight. Wow. We may claim to be followers of Christ. We may claim to believe every truth in the word of God, but this will do our neighbor no good unless our belief is carried into our daily life. Our profession may be as high as heaven, but it will save neither ourselves nor our fellow men unless we are truly Christians. That's, this, that should be in there because a true Christian is one who does and live the way of God. One example, one right example, one right way will do more to benefit the world than all of our profession. So what's important? Not the profession, but the living. And that story of the Good Samaritan tells us that, isn't it? Because the priest and the Levite were probably on their way to go and profess, to go and declare, to go and teach. But didn't the Good Samaritan did one good thing? And here we are still talking about the Good Samaritan. He did the thing. And that one act is better than preaching and teaching. That's why Jesus didn't have to go into all what it means to love your neighbor. He said, let me show you what it looks like. That's what the world is waiting on. Because we've been telling, 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 but we're not being, being, being. And so the world is perishing for a good example of what it means to be X, Y, and Z. You said I should not lie. What does that look like? Do you lie? No, if they should look at my life and your life and see only the truth. Thus we are telling them, thou shalt not lie. That's what it means to be 
a follower of Christ, and particularly in the last days, I want you and I, my brothers and sisters, to continually ask God and surrender through the Holy Spirit to minister the practical living out of the gospel. I don't know about you, but Brother Silas, for me, sometimes, honestly, I get tired of preaching the word of God and it's not being lived. Because it is bothering to the conscience. Here we go again, Lord. We're going to, because, you, you know, you find a lot of lessons in there, like this one. How many times must we preach? Be the sermon. Do good. Be kind. Be loving. How many times must we say it? So it's not that I'm tired of preaching it. I'm tired of preaching it in words. I say, God, I, I, I'm just tired of saying this thing. Oh, I want, let me live it out. And sometimes I wish we didn't have to come to church. I'm going to be honest. Not because I want to stay home. But you know why? I wish we would come and just pray and then go out and be the sermon. Do you know that's a more powerful preaching? That if we come here, let's say, for example, next week, and we don't have a physical worship, but we go out to the community, we go in the park, and we minister to people there, it is a better sermon than if we sat down together and sing again, Kumbaya. Amen. But we wouldn't look at it like that, right? We would say we didn't have church today. But that's the best church according to heaven. That is the best church. So maybe once a quarter, once a year, something, we should begin doing that. And actually, that's what we're going to do for Global Youth Day and Compassion Weekend. That's what we're supposed to really do. It's not supposed to be a church worship service. You come to the church, and you dis or, you know, you, whether it's by departments or whatever, and we divide, and we go and minister. That's what they would call brand Sabbath school at times. Our first seven years at Oakwood, that, I mean, Sabbath school, now, don't judge the pastor now. We were hardly ever in Sabbath school. Why? Because we were in the community every single Sabbath, be in the sermon. And then we come to testify of what happened out there. Because what are you teaching us in Sabbath school? To go ye therefore. So we're gone. <laughs> I don't need to sit down and study the lesson. I'm being the lesson. See? But we are studying the lesson over and over and over and over and over, and we are not doing the lesson. We are heaping coals of fire on our own head. On our own head. It is better to live the word than to hear the word only. Hearing is important, but doing and being is even more important. So the appeal today comes from Elder Ted Wilson, the president of the World Church. And then we will close in prayer. And I hope you will respond to his appeal. That I believe is through the Holy Spirit as well. We will not grow spiritually. The prophet of God could not make it clearer than this when saying, the very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. Where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. What a powerful quotation from the Desire of Ages, page 825. Involvement is the answer to apathy. As the prophet of God says, where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. Now, if you want to be spiritually alive, get involved. If you want a vibrant prayer life, get involved. If you want to appreciate the word of God more, get involved. If you want to have a deeper love for others, get involved. If you want to see souls one to Jesus, get involved. If you want to see Jesus come soon, get involved. Join the hundreds of thousands of Seventh-day Adventist leaders and members around the world who are actively involved in the mission of the church. God wants to use you and me to proclaim his end time prophetic truth to every corner of the globe, and especially the enormous metropolitan centers of the world through mission to the cities, utilizing every form of comprehensive urban evangelism, including comprehensive health ministry and many other methods. The task is great, but God is in. Control. 
and leading his people. Does the church have challenges? It certainly does. But I see evidence of the Holy Spirit's powerfully moving among his people. I see evidence of the Holy Spirit doing some special, exciting activity right now in his church. I see the evidence of the Holy Spirit preparing a people for the coming of Jesus and our Lord's soon return. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, as I appeal to my own heart, to make a full, complete, total consecration to Christ. I appeal to you to embrace the prophetic calling that Jesus has given to this church. Church. The Adventist church. A church that is long from the Advent I appeal to you to in your life. I appeal to you to you to become actively involved in witnessing for your Lord as we anticipate Christ's soon. And so I hope that each and every one of us can make that commitment even now. Let us pray. Eternal Father, blessed be your holy name for reminding us today that you have a calling on each and of our lives. And it is not simply for us to only be knowledgeable about your word, but to be living that word. May this week find us be in the sermon each and every day. May this week be a week, O oh God, where we embody the Good Samaritan, not just as a good story, but as a living story. That every day this week that people will see the story of the Great Samaritan demonstrated before their eyes. Father, may we surrender to the moving and working of the Holy Spirit so that he can accomplish his will and work in and through us. Father, also forgive us for our apathy. Forgive us, O oh God, for our complacency. Forgive us for all the excuses that we make of why we cannot be nor do the things that you have caused us to do. Lord, you left heaven to come to this earth. You did not come to be ministered to, but you came to minister and to give your life as a ransom for each and every one of us. May we not be selfish in keeping the good news, in keeping your glory and your blessings to ourselves. Father, may we seek to tangibly touch the lives of people, not only with religiosity, but practical ways. When we see someone in need, help us to do something about it. If it's a friend, if it's a neighbor, a family member, church member, help us to just be kind and to be loving, Lord. I pray for this church, O oh Lord, that as we seek to move in this direction, that you may help us not to be wary in well-doing, as your word declares, but to be faithful to the very end. To this we pray, in no other name but in the name of Jesus Christ. Let everyone say Amen. amen and amen. May God richly bless you. Let us stand as we say in the closing hymn, 337, Redeemed. And again, for those of you who want to be part of the preaching workshop, today at 530 and 630 at the Greater Randolph Church. God bless you.